Hello, gentlemen, and happy Friday. We've been talking up to this point about the priesthood, the priesthood as it existed in the, its Levitical form in the Old Testament. And then yesterday we began to talk about the priesthood established by Jesus Christ, the priesthood of the New Covenant. One of the things that we noted was that while the Levitical priesthood was separate from the prophetic and the kingly office, in Jesus Christ, the offices of priest, prophet, and king are once again reunited. And as a result, all Christian believers and Christian priests exercise the offices of priest, prophet, and king simultaneously. So what we're going to do then is take a look at what it means to be a priest today by breaking down those offices, the office of priest, prophet, and king. The office of priest being to sanctify the people, the office of prophet being to teach, the office of king to govern. We're going to take a look at that in terms of the New Testament priesthood, and then we're going to see one of the things that the Catechism of the Catholic Church strongly emphasizes, especially in the section on the laity that we've already read, which is that the laity, by virtue of their baptism, also exercise the, the offices of priest, prophet, and king, each in their own ways. The difference being that with the laity, it's called the royal priesthood. This is the priesthood of all believers, is the other term for it. With the uh, ordained priests, it's referred to as the ministerial priesthood. So for me, it's the ministerial priesthood. For all of us, it's the royal priesthood, because God wishes to make of us a nation of kings and priests. So with that, let's start by taking a look at the offices of priest, prophet, and king in the current priesthood, the priesthood established by the one high priest, Jesus Christ. When we talk about the threefold office of the priest, obviously, of course, there is a priestly office. So when we say that an individual acts as a priest or has a priestly role, what we're talking about fundamentally is a duty to sanctify the people, especially through sacraments, prayers, and other blessings. Through sacraments, this one is fairly obvious. There are an, any number of ways in which we make God present and God's grace present to the people be it through baptism, through the Eucharist, through confession, marriage. These are all wonderful ways of allowing God to be present to the people and help to sanctify the people. I remember very much when I was first looking at the Jesuits, or when I was about to enter into the Jesuits. Prior to that, it was, this is while I was still at Texas A&M, the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston, was raised from a diocese to an archdiocese. And so the bishop there, Bishop Fiorenza, suddenly found himself having become Archbishop Fiorenza as a result. And so the local newspaper, the Houston Chronicle, decided to interview Archbishop Fiorenza and get his experience on priestly life and ministry. And one of the things I remember him reflecting on as he reflected on his many, many years as a priest was how as a priest through sacramental ministry, the sacraments allowed him to bring God's presence into people's lives at some of their most critical junctures, be it at birth, through baptism, or through a moment of great conversion. Uh, I've certainly seen that myself with RCIA. I think I've mentioned on one occasion, uh, one individual that I worked with in RCIA, she was going through the program while also staying at a halfway house. So she had recently come out of prison and was living at a halfway house as part of her uh, rehabilitation, her re-entrance into society. And she had just had uh, a really rough life up to that point. A lot of drugs, theft, all sorts of things. And at that moment of baptism, after, as soon as the water was poured over her head, the tears just came streaming down her face as she finally was embraced into the church and was able to put behind her that life of drugs, that life of theft and all of the other things that she had been involved with prior to her time in prison in which prison really made her realize, I don't want any of this. And it was through that sacrament of baptism that the Lord was able to enter into this profound moment of her life where she said, all of these truly awful things that I have done to harm myself and to harm others in really grave ways, no more. I want an end to it. That was a moment of her being sanctified and a moment of God entering into her life in a very powerful way. And every time that she goes to confession, 
she is then able to renew that experience of, I want a time of conversion. I wish to have this experience of conversion. Now, God, enter into this great moment of conversion, this great moment of change. Certainly, likewise, in matrimony, in the Eucharist, God present to us in the day-to-day of our lives, all the way up until the moment of death when we are anointed and prepared by God to enter into that heavenly kingdom. It really is, the sacraments really are a wonderful way for God to enter into the lives of the people and for the priest to sanctify the people throughout these great moments of their lives. And even if the people aren't present, the sacraments are also a part of how the priest sanctifies the individuals. Priests are supposed to offer Mass, to offer the sacrifice of the Mass each day on behalf of the people. There are certain intentions that he is supposed to keep in his heart. I offer Masses on a very regular basis for all of you. I've especially, as a senior class, I've lost count at this point the number of times I have said Mass for the intentions of the senior class and that y'all may have graduation. There have been times when Uh, Maybe I'm aware of a particular problem or issue that you're going through, and I offer Mass like, Lord, be with this person. This is something very common in the lives of priests, where we bring those issues, we bring those problems, and we offer the sacrifice of the Mass on behalf of that person that we've encountered. We bring the power of the sacraments to bear on this person's life. And Mass is not the only way that an individual, that a priest, prays on behalf of the people. The Liturgy of the Hours, or what's sometimes also called the Divine Office or the Breviary, is a significant way in which priests are supposed to pray on behalf of the whole church. In fact, when a man is ordained as a deacon, one of the solemn promises that he makes is to be faithful to the breviary, to be faithful to the five times a day in which he is supposed to offer prayers on behalf of the people and on behalf of the whole church. And this prayer, this breviary, is so important to be able to offer the psalms, which is essentially what the breviary is. It's praying the psalms on behalf of the church. It is so important in the life of a deacon and in the life of a priest. It is actually considered to be a mortal sin for me to not pray my breviary on a particular day. For a non-deacon, for a non-priest, it's perfectly okay for you not to say a breviary, to not say the divine office. If any of y'all, I have no expectation that y'all do it. Uh, even if a monk were to not say the breviary, were not to chant the liturgy of the hours uh, every single day, that would be perfectly fine. As a priest, it is so intrinsically a part of what I do and who I am. In the line of the Old Testament priests, a priest is one who offers prayers and sacrifices on behalf of the people, who stands before God on the people's behalf and offers his prayers for them. It is so important to what I do that to not say the breviary is considered a grave violation of my vocation. It's a mortal sin for me. And this is something that I take very seriously. And again, very often, the problems and issues that people will have brought to me that day. I pray for. I pray for the people who have come to me for counseling, the people who have come to me in confession. Perhaps I'm worried that the advice I gave in confession maybe wasn't good enough. And I'll say in the Liturgy of the Hours, Lord, I may not have given that person great advice. Make up the difference, Lord. Help that person in ways that I cannot. Always, always offering prayers on behalf of the people. And it's really a wonderful experience, a wonderful privilege to be able to pray on behalf of the church, to pray on behalf of all of you as I say in my breviary. And here we have an image of Pope John Paul II praying his breviary really truly on behalf of the universal church. And various other ways of saying blessings. I love being able to say blessings over people, over things, to bless places. Here we have an image from a really great Twitter account whose handle is uh, just below the image. Orthodox priests blessing things. Catholic Church, of course, recognizing the Orthodox uh, priesthood as a perfectly valid sacrament. And so here we have an image of an Orthodox priest saying a blessing over uh, over troops. You'll find all sorts of things, uh, missiles, airplanes, cars, jeeps, farms, nuclear plants, everything. You name it, there is a blessing for it. The same is true for, uh, for the Roman ritual as well. 
through sacraments, through prayers, through blessings, priests exercise that office, that priestly office, that duty to sanctify the people. One of the places where we've seen this most profoundly, I would say, in recent times, was at the end of March, Pope Francis had a prayer service. He had a special Urbi et Orbi blessing. Normally, this is just done at Christmas and at Easter. Pope Francis decided this was such a momentous occasion that we needed to have a special Urbi et Orbi uh, to the city and to the world blessing. And so he had a special blessing. He gave a reflection. And then he blessed the whole world with the monstrance. Here we see Pope Francis uh, with the monstrance giving the Eucharistic benediction, the blessing over the whole world with, uh, with the Eucharist, with the host consecrated at Mass. I'm going to include the link to the entirety of the, uh, of the prayer service. It's about an hour long. You might find it worth seeing the whole thing. You might just want to see the Pope's words. The images are very striking because St. Peter's Plaza is entirely empty. You have the sound of sirens, you have the sound of bells, and there, one Pope standing alone, facing down the world, facing down the evils and illnesses of the world, saying, I am going to bring the blessing and grace of Almighty God upon this. This was a truly momentous occasion. This may have been one of the defining and most iconic moments of Francis's papacy. I strongly encourage you, take a look at this. Take a look at how this Pope, himself frail, Remember, for one thing, he only has one working lung. He had pneumonia as a child years ago. He has one lung that works. He's got a severe limp from sciatica. And yet, this Pope is determined to pray before the cross, to bring the monstrance out, to offer his prayers and his sufferings on behalf of the whole world. It truly was a very moving moment to behold. Take a look in the description below for the link. Go and enjoy, truly savor, this experience of Francis' papacy, one of the defining moments, and truly what it means to be a priest sanctifying and blessing the people. To work as a prophet. Fundamentally, a prophet is not just somebody who foretells, oh, here's the future, here's what's going on. A prophet, first and foremost, is somebody who teaches the people about God. Not every prophet in the Old Testament had visions of the future. In fact, very few did. John the Baptist was considered a prophet. He did not have visions about the future. Prophets, first and foremost, a prophet is somebody who teaches the people about God, especially through preaching and other ministries of the word. Traditionally, the threefold ministries of the word is preaching, teaching, and hearing confessions. Through preaching, of course, uh, not only in Mass, but perhaps most notably in Mass, but this could also be through preaching in a retreat. So if you've ever heard Father Shaughnessy give a talk in Kairos, those are usually some of the most entertaining and most spiritually uplifting moments of any Kairos retreat where Father Shaughnessy tells us about what it means to be a Christian man and why we should be going to confession. Father Shaughnessy is exercising in that moment his prophetic office. He is teaching us about the word. It is an act of preaching. So whether it be in a homily, preaching in a retreat, anything like that, to break open the word, to preach about the word, and to deliver the word of God, this is part of the prophetic office. Through teaching, this is sometimes exercised through the classroom. So when I am teaching, at this very moment, actually, I am exercising my prophetic office in teaching all of you about the word of God. And here down below, we see... Uh, Father Randy Gibbons, who is actually Jesuit High School, class of 1995, and Texas A&M, class of 1999, uh, teaching there. Uh, he's currently teaching at one of our high schools in Houston. He's a Jesuit priest. Uh, he actually entered the year before I did. So any priest who just teaches in general is exercising the ministries of one of the ministries of the word, preaching, teaching, and then hearing confessions. Hearing confessions is considered to be one of the ministries of the word in addition to being a sacrament because counseling in the confessional is generally considered a form of preaching. It's a ministry of the word where you give counsel to, uh, to an individual, as we see this priest giving counsel to, uh, to this young man. 
one of the best pieces of advice I ever got for how to preach, essentially, in confession, because as a Dominican put it to me, that advice you give to somebody in the confessional is a short form of preaching. This Dominican priest said, look for the virtue. Identify the virtue that that person is trying to achieve as he confesses all of his sins, and then advise him how, do you help, how to achieve this virtue. So the man who confesses, I've been unfaithful to, his, to my wife, he's trying to become faithful to his wife. He's seeking the virtue of fidelity. So talk to him a little bit about, thanks be to God for seeking out this virtue of faithfulness to your wife. Here is how you can achieve that virtue of faithfulness in your everyday life. If you confess lying, here's somebody who wants the virtue of honesty. Here's how you can achieve the virtue of honesty in your life. So hearing confessions is very much, uh, especially as you give advice and counsel to somebody, it's an exercise in the prophetic office. And also why Jesuits have especially been charged with because of our intellectual formation. And so a, a sense that we have maybe a greater knowledge of God's word why ministries of the word of preaching, teaching, and hearing confessions has been so often essential to, uh, to the role of Jesuits. G Ignatius especially wanted Jesuits to be very well known as excellent confessors, and we do have that reputation. One Jesuit who I think of especially when I think of somebody who has exercised his prophetic office quite well is Father J.B. Leininger, who uh, his twin brother C.A. was one of the principals here at Jesuit. So if you go uh, to see that wall of principals uh, just outside the second floor chapel, you can see his twin brother, both of whom entered the Jesuits actually on the same day. Uh, you can see him, I think he was served as principal here in the 1950s. Uh, both of them graduated from here in the 1940s. This is Father Leininger on his very last day of teaching as a teacher at Strake Jesuit. He taught pretty much everything. By the time I was a student there, he was the algebra teacher. He taught algebra one to the freshmen and algebra two to the sophomores. On the very last day when he retired from the classroom, you can see also that he lived a very simple life. Every single day, he would wear his Jesuit cassock. On days when he was feeling a little chilly, he would wear that windbreaker you see him wearing there. I think he'd had that since probably the 1970s. And on the very last day of class, he always had the same route from his classroom back to the Jesuit residence, which was elsewhere on campus. And before the last, uh, the last period ended, students basically lined the hallway and lined the entire walkway. And so the Jesuit residence is in a separate part of the campus. The entire pathway that he would take walking from his classroom to the residence, teachers and students, everybody, lined to give him applause. And Father Leininger, very stoic German, simply nodded, nodded his thanks. Thank you, thank you. Good day, good afternoon, as he so often would. This was truly a prophetic Jesuit, a Jesuit who exercised his role as teacher in just about every subject under the heavens until nearly his dying day. He died not too long after his own retirement. And then a king. Kings, of course, are individuals who govern. And we say that a king is exercising his duty, a priest is exercising his kingly duty when he exercises leadership. It's an act, a duty to guide the people to holiness in the kingdom of heaven, especially through spiritual leadership. So Father Brown, of course, is exercising his kingly office as he is serving here as president of Jesuit High School. Archbishop Wilton Gregory, we see him there when he was the Archbishop of Atlanta. Now he's Archbishop of Washington, D.C in exercising that rule, governance over a, a diocese, or when you were pastor of a parish, you were exercising your kingly office. I would also be exercising my kingly office, actually, as I bring order, for better or for worse, to a classroom. Any time that you are exercising leadership, guiding people and organizing the things around you to help the people and to guide everybody closer and closer to heaven, this is exercising your kingly office. Lay people also exercise these offices each in their own way by virtue of their own baptism. They exercise the office of priest as they sanctify. One of the things that you saw in the catechism readings on laity and the family is that parents exercise the office of 
sanctification, parents act as priests by guiding their families into holiness. So when we talk about the vocation of the family and the family as domestic church, as you help your family become a part of the domestic church, as you make your family into a domestic church, a place where faith, hope, and love can dwell, you are exercising your office as royal priests. God wishes to make a nation of priests that includes you. This is the royal priesthood of the laity. In this image here of parents presenting their children to baptism, the priest is exercising his priestly office by baptizing the child. The parents are also exercising their priestly office by having their child baptized. Everybody in that photo, priests and parents alike, are exercising their priestly office each in their own way. And that's going to get at what we're going to talk about in greater detail on Monday, how it is that the laity and the priesthood have complementary offices, how they have offices that complement, that balance each other out, that work together. All of them are exercising their priestly office right now, as are the godparents as well, by helping to bring about the sanctification of that child. Their prophetic role as teachers. We can all be teachers. We can all teach people about what it means to love God. We can all teach people more and more about who God is. As St. Francis of Assisi, well, he himself actually didn't say it, but it's famously attributed to St. Francis, preach the gospel, always use words if necessary. Everybody can show people what the love of God means through their day-to-day -day life. Here we see an image of Mr. DeLatte in his classroom. So here Mr. DeLatte is exercising his prophetic office as a baptized layman. He is exercising his charism as a layperson. All of the teachers here, any Christian teacher at Jesuit High School is exercising their baptismal dignity. When you're baptized, you are baptized priest, prophet, and king. This is actually explicitly said in the baptismal ritual. Any, any of the teachers here are, in their own ways, exercising that prophetic office uh, by doing this. Even if you aren't a formal teacher in living in such a way that helps people understand what it means for God to love the world, for instance, you are living a prophetic life. Think about the whole purpose of the sacrament of matrimony. The sacrament of matrimony shows people concretely what it means for Christ to love the church, for God to love the world. A married couple who lives out the sacrament of matrimony, who lives out their vocation, without a word, is teaching the world how to love. And in that way, a married couple, in living out their vocation, are exercising jointly their office of prophet. Kings, or queens, if we're uh, if for ladies, uh, one may exercise the office of king by organizing the things around you rightly. I think, for instance, of Mattress Mac. You can be a businessman and exercise the office of king. You don't necessarily have to be uh, a lay person who is exercising governance within the church. And I think that's especially important to remember. The lay people exercise the kingly office or the queenly office, their royal office, let's say, their monarchical office, monarchical office, not just by doing churchy things. They exercise that kingly office or that queenly office by doing their own jobs and organizing the things around them in a Christian sort of way. So Mattress Mac uh, is a Houston furniture mogul. Mattress Mac, it, on multiple occasions, has really, he is a dedicated Roman Catholic. He's a truly wonderful individual. He has done so much for his community, most notably when Hurricane Harvey struck, Mattress Mac decided, you know what, there's a lot of people who are out of their homes right now because of all of the flooding. And you know what I have in all of my furniture stores? Beds with mattresses, because my nickname is Mattress Mac. And you know what people can sleep on? Mattresses. Maybe if I open up my mattress and furniture stores to people who are homeless, to people who are displaced right now, I can help alleviate their suffering. So I would say Mattress Mac has exercised, was exercising his kingly office by using and running his business in a Christian way, in a Catholic way, and especially in that moment of crisis. And that was not the only time 
Mattress Mac has shown himself to be a great leader of the community and a true man for others, even though I don't know that he ever went to a Jesuit high school. Mattress Mac has truly exercised his office of king in a truly Christian way. This is what it means to be a layman out there in the world, sanctifying the world. As priest, as prophet, as king, both the ministerial priesthood and the royal priesthood helps to bring about the sanctification of the church and the sanctification of the world, allowing the church to exist as a sacrament for the world and therefore allowing the world to be made more holy, allowing the people in the world to be drawn closer and closer to Jesus Christ for their own salvation. What we're going to do as we continue on, we're going to take a look then on Monday about the threefold division of holy orders and then take a more detailed look at how it is that the priests and the laity can truly work together as one church for the sanctification of the world. Have a good weekend, gentlemen. Take care. Go sanctify the world.